I'm standing in for Anna Mide, who has graciously provided the popcorn, so that had a, it was double booked with something in philosophy, so hence her absence. But anyway, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Martin Beach, a longtime astronomer here at Campion, who has regularly <laughs> dazzled us with his wisdom in matters astronomical. So uh, we're looking forward to a really exciting uh, talk this afternoon, which is going to be on circles of the moon. Yes, this is it. Um, and in seeming mysteries of the second that's right. Yes, it's uh, that wisdom bit that threw me. Uh, <laughs> um, in the right. It was in. It's got a, it's got a big container full of food. There. All right. Okay. So we'll say we're assembling as a second. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I should probably stop now while I do the game <laughs> in some sense. But uh, nonetheless, um, I guess. If, uh, I guess a topic that I was working on just before, or finished working on in some sense, just before Christmas time. Um, and uh, again, it was a bit, uh, the introduction is, I suppose, a bit like the last idle talk I gave, which is about a year ago, um, in the sense of uh, really just exploring some of the um, history of astronomy research um, that sort of I get involved with every now and then, uh, purely by chance, in the sense of it was um, a surprise discovery uh, of um, a letter, uh, as we'll see in what's called the Gentleman's Magazine for 1742, so I'm catching up with my reading, uh, finally. Um, and, but it was one of those things that caught my eye, and since I was looking for something entirely different, a uh, entirely different topic, um, although it was astronomy related, uh, but this uh, it caught my eye, and I, what surprised me perhaps as much as anything was uh, A, that it was 1742 that the question was being asked, and then B, when you follow about, about a year's plus uh, worth of correspondence about the very question, um, it's apparent that nobody knew the answer, uh, for sure. Um, and so it struck me as one of those things that, uh, you know, if I'd been asked when the details had been worked through, um, I probably wouldn't have said 1742 was the beginning of it, or it was that late, in terms of anticipating it being much sort of earlier. Uh, than actually took place. So, uh, here we are. Uh, so now I was working away in my office, as per usual, uh, doing all the research stuff, uh, as it were. Um, and, uh, as I say, I was looking for uh, information uh, about, uh, in fact, it was related to, um, indeed, the last topic um, for the idle talk, which is this idea of planetary machines, as they're called. So these are uh, sort of gearing clockwork devices that were um, uh, specifically made to mimic the heavens, to show the motion of the planets, including spin and eclipses and all these other things that one might want to try and sort of demonstrate sort of, you know, to a class uh, and the teaching of astronomy. And so that, in some sense, was also the, uh, the other thing that struck me about uh, the correspondence that took place, and here it is, that well, caught my eye, as they say, uh, <laughs> with respect to the Gentleman Magazine, April 1742, um, was this was the letter here. Uh, shown on the right. I'm sure you can't read that, but I guess the, the basic idea here is um, it sort of starts off in a sort of a wonderful fashion. So, uh, you know, though I am an, uh, entirely naive in all parts of mathematical learning, yet I cannot possess, uh, pro uh, profess myself uh, an admirer of the, uh, of the excellent branch of knowledge. There's too many X for S's there, uh, as the saying goes. Uh, but the idea is, is uh, it's, uh, basically it's a sort of uh, somebody who sort of like to sort of read astronomy books that are available every now and then, um, and is sort of delved into, uh, well, he said, I, I was the other day reading an account of the solar system. I don't actually know whose book he was reading. Um, and what uh, the, the question he's asking um, in this August journal, the Gentleman's Magazine, found it, uh, in fact, this was, it, it was in its 11th year uh, of publication at this time, uh, founded in the uh, 1731 uh, by uh, the uh, editor, first editor, Edward Cabo there, who was, uh, went under the pseudonym Sylvanus Urban. And that's one of the uh, intriguing things about this whole unravelling of this topic, once the question gets going. Um, it's trying to work out who was involved with trying to answer it. Most of it, the, uh, uh, the characters turn out to be, uh, well, mysterious, for want of a better way of saying it. Because mm -hmm. uh, they all use pseudonyms, basically, uh, or most of them do, or just sort of some set of symbols, uh, as the case may be. But the question seemed harmless enough. Uh, I guess, as I say, this is what sort of caught my eye. Uh, in a sense, it seems like a simple question. You would have thought it would have been well understood by, uh, well, 1742. Um, and it basically goes on to the sort of the final sort of paragraph there, saying, well, OK, we've got the moon going around the Earth, and we sort of, uh, you know, we're used to the idea of uh, how that's used with respect to uh, explaining the phases of the moon. And then we also know, as, you know, from Copernicus and uh, what have you, from the early mid-1500s, uh, that the Earth is going around the sun. So we've got this sort of double motion in some sense. If we imagine looking down, uh, upon the solar system, what is the path that the moon travels as it's sort of going around the Earth and the Earth is going around the sun? 
So that's, it's, it's, as I say, it seems like a harmless enough question. Um, I guess it's one of those harmless questions until you start thinking about uh, the details. I suppose that's one of the other uh, things that comes along. And then the, uh, the other problem is how do you actually demonstrate this? And this is what uh, the correspondence, in some sense, sort of struggled with between 1742 and 1743. Um, so let's go back a little bit in the sense of the moon, the sun and the earth, in the sense of it does have uh, this ancient heritage, uh, in the sense of uh, these are sort of the diagrams you find on the internet nowadays, um, and in sort of all textbooks explaining the phases of the moon, showing the animation over here, we're all used to that, full moon today, uh, luckily it's not. February the 13th, as well. not sorry, uh, Friday the 13th is what mm -hmm. I meant to say. Uh, full moon on Friday the 13th, that would have been a definite omen. Um, but nonetheless, the idea here is, is that, you know, the, um, uh, the idea of the phases of the moon that we see all relates to this idea of the, basically it's a geometry between the sun, sun's up on the, uh, uh, the right here, all the sunlight comes in, so these arrows here illuminating uh, half of the moon's sphere. And then the idea is, is the phase that we see just relates to what fraction of the uh, moon's uh, illuminated hemisphere that we can see from the Earth. And this basic explanation of the, um, the moon phases, uh, I mean, we can find you know, correct explanation of this going back to the ancient Greek philosophers, and Anaxagoras, 450 BC. So this is the sort of stuff, the picture that um, you know, was sort of, uh, is sort of literally ancient classic astronomy. Um, and so the only sort of addition to this sort of picture in some sense was, you know, the, as I said, the sun's off over here somewhere, is then, you know, we've got the sort of the picture of the moon going around the earth, and now we're just putting the earth in motion around the sun, uh, as Copernicus sort of uh, uh, suggested long ago. Uh, now the moon sort of under, uh, the moon does have a very complex orbit. It has to be said, uh, in the sense of the uh, the motion with respect to the moon uh, is elliptical, uh, in the sense of the Earth, I should say. Uh, in the sense of the actual angular diameter of the moon does change during the course of one phase cycle. Uh, the uh, a diagram at the uh, lower right there shows the maximum variation between a full moon when it's at its greatest distance from the Earth, it's called apogee, and this is the same same moon, but now at perigee, which is a bit closer. So you can see that the this does actually sort of vary in size as um, in the sense of uh, where we actually get to see the moon in its orbit. Uh, so it's sort of um, the angular size does change. Um, and indeed, this was first recorded and measured by uh, one of the great unsung heroes, in some sense, of uh, astronomy, uh, Jeremiah Horrocks. Uh, who, um, I guess, as well, as we've got these sort of numbers shown in there, uh, it was in 1638, around about that time, uh, that he actually uh, was developing uh, instruments to measure the angular size of the sun and the moon, um, and he realised that the idea of the sun's, uh, uh, sorry, the moon's angular size was changing um, as it went through a complete phase cycle from new moon to full moon and back to new moon again, and he realised that was the first indication uh, that the moon's orbit had to be elliptical. Uh, and indeed it sort of agreed with Kepler's motion, which was, I guess Kepler introduced those uh, in uh, the early 1600s. So very soon after sort of Kepler's publishing these sort of uh, classical results about the motion of the planets, uh, Horace comes along uh, and realises uh, with respect to uh, direct observations, uh, he develops his new uh, lunar theory uh, in the sense of, uh, as in the sense of uh, published in his sort of collected works uh, posthumously in 1673. Um, so again, it's, it's one of those cases, you know, the work was done, it's recorded, and it's all there, but we don't actually get to hear about it for some you know, 40 plus years, or 30 plus years or so, um, after you know, the work's been done. Uh, and indeed, it was sort of published by uh, John Flamstead, who was the first astronomer royal in 1673, who saw it through the press. Um, so Horrocks was, um, uh, again, in fact, in fact, featured in the last talk, which is partly where I was going with the original uh, research, uh, with respect to the transit of Venus. And he was the first person to predict um, and then observe a transit of Venus across the sun's disk in 1639, uh, as commemorated in this sort of stained glass window at the uh, church where he used to live, uh, much Hool. Um, and uh, according to Wikipedia, who well, must be right, uh, Hool is the ancient English for hovel. So I guess it wasn't a particularly good place to live, uh, much of a hovel. <laughs> Uh, in some sense, but in Lancashire, Northern Europe. So um, this was the, uh, I guess, the sort of the picture uh, that you know the, we have the explanation of the, uh, the moon's phases going back sort of 2,000 plus years. Then we move into, as you can see, the sort of early to mid 1600s, where the idea of you know the moon's variation in size as it moves around. The Earth has been measured, um, and a lunar theory has been developed to explain its positions and sort of angular size, the function of position, and so on. And so then it sort of seems rather late, in some sense, 1742, uh, we get our question asked, as they say. If we're looking down from above with our omnipotent viewer, as the saying goes, I couldn't find any Monty Python trumpet players, I guess, so, uh, either, so I've got a little rabbit blowing all of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the sense of we're looking down from above, 
And we're just combining all of these sort of observations in the sense of the motions. We've got, uh, well, 1543, that's Copernicus, uh, comes along and says, you know, the, uh, the sun is the center of the solar system, Earth is third planet out. So that's the sort of uh, the uh, larger ellipse there. And then, well, 1638, Jeremiah Horrocks was, is showing that the moon's uh, orbit is elliptical. Um, and so we're just saying that, you know, looking down from above, what is the path uh, stretch of not stretched, sketched out? by the moon um, from you know, sort of looking down from above. And as I say, it seems like a simple question in some sense, and we've probably got a mind's eye picture that immediately springs, uh, springs to view. And so that's what Philip Laster was asking in 1742. Uh, and so the surprise to me was, in fact, it wasn't clear exactly what the path of the moon should be uh, to the people who responded uh, to his uh, initial letter. So the number of possibilities, I say, immediately spring to mind uh, in the sense of you know, somewhere between a sort of a Ptolemaic uh, type uh, image where we have sort of epicycles, uh, where you know, this would be uh, the sun at the center uh, of our sort of diagram here. So this is uh, uh, in astronomical units, if we dare use it. The idea of the Earth's orbit is one astronomical unit. It just makes life simple. Uh, so the idea is we can sort of think of you know, the moon's going around the Earth, the Earth is going around the sun. So we might think of something having these so-called epicyclic loops in there. Uh, or if not that, then something like the sort of at least a wavy line of one form or another, sort of going in and, uh, and out as a lower diagram, again to the same scale, with the idea of the wiggly line here corresponds to the path of the moon, as you see it um, you know, in the course of one year as the Earth goes around the sun and the moon sort of following it around, at least a wavy line or something like that. Um, so the, the perfect circle there, uh, as I've drawn it here, or the computer's drawn it, I should say, uh, is um, the, uh, the, the Earth's orbit. So that's a sort of an intuitive, you know, we sort of, because of the way in which we're thinking about sort of the, uh, the idea of uh, the diagrams for the moon phases and so on, uh, you know, we think it'd be something like this. Um, at least that's one possibility. I guess this sort of builds into this idea of, um, I don't know why kids play with these things anymore, spirographs. Do we remember spirographs? Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Some, no, two or three people, good. Uh, so uh, the idea is, you know, you've got sort of gears rolling around each gears and producing all sorts of curves of one form or another. Um, and indeed, there's a sort of, uh, in some sense, there's a sort of a midway curve uh, between uh, these two extremes, if you like. One uh, curve that sort of um, is sort of a bit more sort of um, circular in its arc, for want of a better expression, uh, than the wavy uh, curve I've drawn in the lower diagram. Um, and then sort of uh, an epicyclic curve without any loops in it. Uh, this relates to uh, a curve called the cycloid, which is uh, one of those sort of classic curves uh, that has been studied by mathematicians for uh, seemingly forever, uh, in some sense. The further you go back, the more and more people seem to talk about these things. It's, uh, the cycloid is one of those uh, curves that has many different applications. I mean, it's the shape of bridge arches, for example, because of the, the way it... Uh, um, uh, stress uh, and loads uh, are distributed by, uh, by that arch. It's also a shape that gives you an equal time pendulum swing as well. So it was, uh, the cycloid was used uh, to regulate early clocks to sort of keep the, uh, a synchronous swing for the pendulum. So it has lots of applications. And the idea here is, it's against, uh, in the sense of going to um, a cycling an analogy, um, is that uh, with respect to uh, the idea of uh, the curve itself, we can imagine uh, the, the dandy on his horse here. Um, and there's some sort of spot on his tyre, for want of a better expression, um, hence the idea of the damned horses at that time. Uh, and then the idea is, it's the cycloid curve, it's the, if we follow that spot as the cycle moves to the right, um, and then say, well, what is the path um, as we move along to the right, um, taken by um, our little spot uh, stuck onto the tyre, so we'll let it run through another time. So this is what's called a cycloid in, in the sense of generating it. Uh, so that's sort of, uh, this is the, the curve that we end up sort of producing here, is following that spot on the rim of our tyre um, as it goes uh, to the right. So this is what's called a cycloid. Uh, well, cl clearly the moon's orbit is not so well, uh, in the sense of uh, the, uh, the baseline about which the, um, the Earth will be... Uh, Right, I mean, the moon will be tracing out, will not be a straight line, it will be a curved line. So this is where we can do our penny farthing bit, uh, in the sense of as from the first video, uh, in the sense of we can imagine the bigger uh, circle of our penny farthing being the Earth's orbit. And then what's happening is we're sort of following uh, a point on the, uh, the little farthing bit as it rolls around uh, the circumference of the bigger circle, the, uh, uh, the penny part of the bicycle. And this produces what's called an epicycle. Um, as the red curve sort of being traced out here shows. And so this is the idea of sort of, as I say, sort of an in-between uh, of a wavy path and it sort of just stops having any, uh, in the sense of if you extended that line of the radius of this circle a little bit in interior, 
to the, uh, the blue circle there would end up with sort of loops being produced as in the, uh, uh, the earlier diagram. So this is that sort of one uh, where we have the cusp, technically, I suppose, um, at the circumference of the blue circle. And indeed, it turns out this was the chosen curve uh, by our correspondents in the, the Gentleman's Magazine, this idea of the so-called epicycle. Uh, so we end up with a picture uh, in the sense of something like this. I guess this is again just sort of uh, the computer getting to uh, show the idea again. Here's the sun. Uh, the solid circle line there represents the Earth's orbit. And then the idea is, is this sort of uh, uh, petaled type curve is the epicycloid, which gives the position uh, or the motion of looking down from above um, of the moon uh, as it follows the Earth around during the course of one year. Um, and so, and then the idea is the outermost part of the loop there, that would correspond to full moon, uh, if you're talking about phases, uh, and then the sort of the cusp points there would correspond to new moon if we're talking about, again, phases, although phases are not really the key thing. In this particular case, it's just what the moon's path follows uh, as a function of time. So this was the basic dialogue, uh, in the sense of, well, I won't go through everything, because uh, it gets a bit extended, uh, but we have basically eight players in the game over the course of, actually, multiple years, this is just the first part. Um, so, uh, and it's one of those interesting dialogues where it's basically most people are talking at each other as opposed to to each other and sort of trying to convince them one to another. So it's mostly gentleman-like, uh, although there's certainly, as we get into 1743, it deteriorates, I'm afraid. It's, uh, if you read it through, uh, they're definitely calling each other names uh, by the time it gets to the end. Uh, in the sense that no one's really convinced, uh, they've sort of compassed around uh, getting close towards the correct answer. But even by the time uh, we get to 1744, um, there's no sort of convincing clear argument to what the shape actually should be uh, and its characteristics. So again, that was the, part, the surprising part. So it begins, as I was saying, in April uh, with the, uh, Philip Laster's uh, question. Um, no idea who this is. Again, looking through the various indexes um, of uh, the Gentleman's Magazine. It's the only letter he ever wrote uh, to that particular magazine. Uh, so, um, uh, again, uh, no address given in the sense of we don't know where he was writing from or anything about it. Uh, so there you go, that's sort of the uh, first uh, uh, mystery uh, participant, if that's the right way of saying it. But you can see in the very next issue, in fact, there is an answer provided by uh, somebody called them, calling themselves uh, Philalethis, if I got the pronunciation right, which uh, technically means uh, the lover of truth, as far as I uh, give it uh, understanding with respect to the translation. So we don't know who this person is as well. Um, it, was a very, it was a fairly common pseudonym at that time. Um, and there were various Philadelphia's from sort of Oxford and Philadelphia's from Cambridge and other places around the world. Uh, not sorry, uh, of England, perhaps I should say. Uh, all we know about this particular Philadelphia's is it was he was was he was from Durham, if I can actually say it. Um, and so we know well northern England, I suppose. Um, but again, it's been I haven't been able to find out um, or um, sort of find a reference to who this particular. Uh, correspondent was, although they were esteemed, they did write lots of letters to the Gentleman's Magazine and other um, journals which had mathematical questions associated with them. So there was certainly no mean uh, mathematician. Um, and he basically made, he immediately comes forward and says, uh, it's an epicycle. So that's the one with the little petal arches that we just drew. Uh, then we get to July, and then a correspondent is called JG. Again, we don't know where they're writing from, or what JG stands for, or uh, anything else. Uh, writes back another letter and says, no, Philalethes is wrong. It's not actually an epicycloid. Uh, in fact, it turned out to be, uh, I guess in, uh, using the modern uh, name, would be a curtate epicycloid, and I'll explain that in a minute later on, uh, which was introduced by XY, another uh, mysterious person uh, in the dialogue, uh, who just, you know, again, no address, it's just, you know, yours faithfully, XY. Uh, and then goes from there. So um, I guess it's immediately brought into question exactly what is the, uh, the, the shape of the curve. Essentially, uh, JG is arguing it's more like a wavy curve that we had in the, sort of the lower diagram, uh, the ones we were initially looking at. So it didn't have, he wasn't saying there were loops there, but he said it was more of a sort of a wavy curve uh, as opposed to an epicycle directly. Uh, then uh, uh, one of the two players that we do know something about, although we don't know an awful lot having said that, uh, is James Badder comes along, uh, gets into the dialogue uh, in August, um, and comes back and says, no, Philadelphia is right, JG is wrong, um, it is a cycloidal curve, um, and there's, uh, also he says you know, the special characteristic about this curve as well um, is that the curvature is always such that it points towards the, uh, the sun. So the sun is the central 
uh, focal point um, of the, uh, the curve that traces out the moon's orbit as we see it from above. And so this is where it starts to get interesting. In fact, this is where uh, ultimately we get to the correct physical answer uh, with respect to central forces. So this is Newtonianism coming into play. Uh, indeed, we're dealing uh, at this stage, Newton's been dead about sort of uh, 17 years. So it's, you know, it's fairly close to the idea of uh, when all this idea of gravity was being introduced. Um, so he's saying something about the shape of the curve as well. And this becomes, in fact, the sticking point uh, about which everyone argues about uh, when it, uh, uh, as the, the dialogue uh, continues. Then, uh, so James Banner, um, he was one of these sort of independently wealthy people um, who um, basically was interested in mathematics and because he had lots of money just indulged himself in some sense of doing uh, mathematics type things. Um, and it, uh, in the year before this, in fact 1741, uh, he founded uh, a new journal called the Gentleman's Di Diary. Yes, I have to remember these things. So different to the Gentleman's Magazine, uh, which had a subtitle of, in fact I, was, I knew what to get this, but this is why I wrote it down. It had the subtitle of the Mathematics mathematical repository. Um, so I guess uh, his argument was the only gentleman do mathematics, I presume, uh, at that stage of the game. Uh, so he was a well-known sort of, uh, if you like, amateur player. He wasn't associated with any university, he was just independently wealthy, uh, interested in mathematics. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know finance journals and uh, the uh, uh, and so on to go with that um, and so he comes back and says you know uh, he produces a physical model uh, which is where we get to the demonstration bit uh, later on um, and we'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a few moments uh, then as you can see in October Edmund Weaver comes along again Edmund Weaver uh, is one of those known characters uh, who uh, describes himself and again I'd better look this up um, as a licensed physician and student of celestial science <coughs> it was um, so um, and uh, he's been on the scene for at least the previous 20 years, publishing uh, an almanac um, of you know, moon rise and set times and all those sorts of things, um, as one done, uh, does, uh, which was called the British Telescope, uh, I guess those are the days uh, in some sense. Um, and so he comes along and says, no, I think uh, James Badder's wrong, I think Philalaeus is wrong, and in fact I think JG is right. So if you can see, we've immediately got two sides starting to come into play. Um, and so then the mud slinging starts, I guess, in some sense, uh, as you read through these things. Uh, November, Philalaeus comes back and says, well, you know, Mr. Weaver there, um, you know, you're making assertions without proof, um, and you, know, you should justify your sort of uh, statements. So, well, then there's a bit of a gap, as you can see, November to August, I guess Edmund Weaver is fuming away, uh, deciding on what his appropriate reply should be. Um, but he comes back, um, he doesn't change his mind, he says, no, I'm still, you know, I think I'm right, you're wrong, uh, in some sense, and then sort of finishes off with a sort of, you know, a sort of backhanded insult in some sense. You know, the wisest of men are liable to oversights and mistakes uh, in some sense, so, um, well, why not? Uh, so nothing has particularly changed at this stage of the game. Uh, then, uh, essentially, uh, Richard, well, Richard Gates, again, we don't know who this is, or at least I don't know, um, in the sense of no address is given from where he's right from uh, or any sort of other references one can find in other uh, similar such uh, magazines and journals. Um, uh, although he, can, he must clearly consider himself to be um, of um, you know, some sort of mathematical skill uh, because he starts criticizing everybody, saying, you know, nobody's got this right yet and nobody's convinced me whatsoever. Um, so then uh, November XY comes back and said, well, Yates yeah, should just read and be learning uh, about you know, how to do these things as opposed to criticizing everybody. Uh, and then XY starts to criticize everybody having done that, uh, usual story, uh, but then comes back and says, well, actually, I think sort of uh, JG and Weaver are right, uh, but he suggests that, in fact, it's a sort of a, um, a slight hybrid of the epicycloid curve. Uh, this is a thing called curtailed epicycloid. I'll show a diagram of that in just a few minutes. Um, and this is really just the same as a cycloid, but rather than following a point on the rim of our little circle as it moves along, um, you're following a point on one of the spokes, if you like, of the, uh, uh, the little circle. So it's interior to the diameter of the smaller circle. Um, and so it produces something without these cusps, uh, which is the, uh, the characteristic part of the epicycloid. Um, and so then uh, Richard Gates comes back again and says, well, you know, this is, uh, you know, I've sort of, uh, uh, I've had enough of you lot. Let's consider another question. So he asks the question about why do we always see the same face of the moon, uh, even though the phase changes. So again, this comes back to... Um, uh, a gravitational level Newtonian sort of explanation, and indeed Philalaeus comes back almost in, well in the very next issue of January and answers this question and says, you know, let's do something more interesting. Um, and um, then at the same time in December, Thomas Sparrow comes along again, don't know who he is, 
and basically says, well, you know, I'm not convinced by any of your arguments. Uh, let's sort of, uh, what we really need is not sort of diagrams, what we don't, you know, we need more than just words. We need, you know, good old mathematical proof with fluxions or uh, differential calculus, as we would call it in the modern era. Uh, so, um, so James Barrett, uh, sorry, Thomas Sparrow is sort of almost giving up on everybody. Uh, then James Banner comes back again in 1744, um, and uh, with a trigonometric calculation, it's non-trivial, um, I, um, I guess it's, uh, what's the expression, I, I guess I didn't follow it all the way through, I think is what I'm trying to say, uh, in the sense that there's lots of uh, um, sort of numbers that seem to be appearing out of nowhere uh, that go in and say, yes, and here's the result, uh, that proves I was right, uh, back here with my cycloidal curve that always curves away uh, from the sun. Uh, and then things go sort of fairly quiet, but we can do a summary slide from the images you can get from the journals um, of what's been presented as the various possible curves. And so uh, these first two, this is uh, in fact taken from the paper by Philalesis, uh, who's talk, talking about the idea of the development of the cycloid and the epicycloid, just as I sort of uh, done in the previous slide. Uh, then this is uh, some of the other uh, uh, diagrams that were presented showing that epicycloid development um, with respect to um, the... Um, the little circle rolling along uh, the larger circle, uh, or centred on the Earth's orbit, which is the perfect circle, there's a solid line in there. Uh, then others, this is uh, JG and Edmund Weaver, talk about this idea of a more wavy line, uh, and indeed they sort of give them through the detailed diagram showing the phases of the moon, the position of the moon, uh, and they talk about the curvature uh, of uh, the particular path that was seen. In fact, this becomes the, uh, the big sticking point, uh, whether uh, the path of the moon actually curves away from the sun uh, at the time of what are called the quarter phases, when the moon is exactly half illuminated, um, or whether in fact it continues curving towards the sun. So this is a condition of uh, either convex or concave uh, shape to the curve. Um, so we're getting into sort of some of the more, um, uh, I guess, complex issues to try and um, demonstrate mathematically, but we'll try and get there uh, sooner or later. Uh, so this is the various ideas, and this is James uh, Badder's trencher, as he called it, uh, which is his first sort of uh, idea of a model uh, to show the type of curve uh, that should result. So the idea here is uh, this was meant to be the sun. That's the, the arc here, the bit of the, uh, the Earth's orbit. Uh, the circle here. Uh, showing the, uh, a schematic uh, for the moon's orbit. Uh, so in other words, the moon is sort of moving around uh, in a circle around the Earth, and then the Earth is moving around the sun. And then he's talking about the idea that you know, we can go from day to day. Uh, across the top here, we've got a scale uh, going from 0, 5 days, 10 days, 15, 20, 25. So uh, each sort of day, the Earth is moving approximately one degree uh, around in its orbit. And so the idea is we can move this line around uh, day by day across that scale at the top. And then uh, with our little uh, dial here divided up into uh, the motion of the moon during one uh, orbit around the Earth, the so-called sidereal period, uh, again appropriately divided, you can move a little pin around in the position of the moon day by day by day. And then the idea is you move them around and each one of these dots corresponds to the position of the pin. Um, and then the idea is you draw them together and that was his argument. I guess it was a, a mathematical sort of uh, demonstration, teaching device, for want of a better expression, uh, to show the shape of a curve. Uh, the, particularly the epicycloid. Okay, all well and good. Uh, so that was the, uh, the main thrust of it. This is the, uh, the curtate epicycloid I was talking about uh, with respect to XY, uh, which is a variant on uh, Badder's trencher. Uh, and in fact, with this particular uh, curve, which everyone immediately rejects and says, no, it can't possibly be that, in fact, turns out to be closer to the right answer, uh, go figure, as the saying goes. But it's the idea is just a slight variation on the theme uh, in the sense that we've got a circle uh, here uh, which corresponds uh, to uh, the moon's orbit. Uh, around the Earth, the Earth is at the centre there, the Sun is over on the far left, um, and uh, the idea now is, um, actually, that's, uh, although I've labelled that the Moon's orbit, it should be the inner circle is the Moon's orbit, uh, that's the Moon's disk, with the idea that this, this disk here rolls around that sort of arc there, just shown from R to P, um, but the Moon's uh, position on the disk is interior to it, uh, and so this is the idea that we're following that spot, as it says in this lower little animation there, uh, of uh, a point on the spokes of our little wheel as opposed to uh, the cycloid, which is following a, pot, a spot on the rim uh, of our circle. Going far too fast, I should slow that one down uh, in the sense I can't follow that. Uh, so it's a sort of variant on the scheme suggested by Edmund Weaver uh, and J.G. 
uh, whoever they were. So we've got lots of uh, geometrical ideas, and indeed that's sort of the entire argument is all around the geometry, um, in the sense of nobody at this stage of the game is sort of uh, suggesting that what we really need to look at is the sort of gravitational interaction and the, the dynamics uh, are, you know, that would control the path of the moon, uh, which is a gravitational interaction between the Earth and the, uh, the Sun, and how that acts upon the moon. Uh, as, it, uh, well, as a three-body problem. Uh, nobody at this stage is suggesting we, got, we need to look at that at all. It's just purely geometry um, that uh, is being sort of, um, sort of argued about, if that's the right way of saying it. Uh, again, this is the idea of that closing sort of argument in January 1744 by James Badder. Again, he's sort of getting comp more complicated diagrams. It's a, a complicated calculation, which I'm not too sure I could make any sense of, uh, even if I had the time and uh, inclination to follow it all the way through. Uh, but he basically... Uh, um, you know, um, concludes that he was right, go figure, I suppose in some sense. He said, you know, it is a curve that's always uh, bending towards the sun uh, in the sense of, you know, if we follow it sort of closely, and it's still an epicycloid track, so you're not convinced about anything. Uh, but then right at the very end there, he actually says something useful, uh, which is about time perhaps, uh, in the sense of he mentions that there's a diagram very similar to that by, um, by J.G. Um, in uh, William Grace Ender's uh, Mathematical Elements of Natural Philosophy, which was published in 1720. So we went scurrying away to find uh, uh, the appropriate sort of copy uh, on the internet, of course. So the, all these things are scanned nowadays, which is very nice. Uh, so indeed, you can go back to um, the, uh, the English translation came out almost immediately uh, along with the Latin, ver Latin version. Um, and uh, as far as I can tell at this present day, this is the very first time uh, a discussion looking at the moon's orbit from above, if you like, as opposed to just a satellite of the Earth. Uh, is brought into play. Uh, and I guess at 1720, Newton was still alive at that stage of the game. He was sort of got a few years left, uh, although he'd sort of moved into sort of other circles than uh, uh, the... Uh uh, that of physics in the sense of, I guess, it was looking after the English coinage and stuff at that stage. Um, so uh, this is the diagram. Uh, you can go to, as it says, the mathematical elements. Uh, and indeed, uh, the thing about uh, Gravelander, uh, he was the first sort of great, one of the great popularizers of uh, Newtonian dynamics. Um, and uh, along with uh, uh, um, J.T. Desigalliers, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct as well. Uh, but anyway, he was also one of the great popularizers of uh, uh, Newtonian approach. Um, and so here's the diagram that he includes in his... Um, 1720 uh, natural philosophy uh, confirmed, well, as it say, you know, confirmed by experiments um, and you know, introduction to Isaac Newton's philosophy. Um, and it's um, uh, now it, uh, he's using uh, not geometry but a pure, uh, in some sense, dynamical, physical, gravitational argument. In other words, he's talking about things called central forces. In other words, uh, I guess it's sort of this idea that something will um, be curving away from a straight line path if it's acted on by net, for, net force. This is uh, Newton's first law of motion, basically. So the idea is if something's moving in a curve, there must be a continuous gravitational force, some center somewhere, pulling that object away from a straight line. Um, and so uh, he starts the, uh, he gives a correct physical argument uh, of saying that the motion of the moon must be you know, related to the central forces acting between the moon and the earth and the moon and the sun. Um, and so he then sort of ends up drawing this diagram here um, with uh, talking about sort of the way in which the curvature of the tra trajectory would go. Uh, but he gets it wrong uh, in the sense of, uh, with the idea, the exact way the curve um, will work, whether it always curves towards the sun, or whether at various times, specifically at these times of the so-called quarter phases, whether in fact it's actually curving away from the moon, or sorry, the sun, or curving towards it, uh, he goes for curving away, and that turns out to be uh, where he gets it wrong. Um, so it's just purely, there's no numbers, there's no formula, there's no Newtonianism equations put into this, uh, it's just purely a diagram, and then the words are put around it of how things should work uh, at this stage of the game. So again, it's not really a convincing argument one way or another, which is exactly what James Badder says, um, why he sticks to his perfect epicycloid. It turns out. So the idea is, is that we uh, have a summary so far. Here's January 1744. Uh, this discussion stops. Indeed, the editor said, I've had enough of this, basically. <laughs> Don't send me any more letters. Uh, and we'll sort of go on to other things. Um, and so that's where it sort of uh, stops for, uh, a, well, at least a year or so, uh, in the sense of, well, we get to... Um, the calls for a mathematical proof. Uh, we've got sort of all sorts of ideas coming along uh, with the idea of the possible geometry, you know, what the curve should look like. Uh, we've got some idea of, you know, it's got to be 
ultimately linked to a gravitational interaction between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and exactly how all that plays out um, with respect to, you know, that would require knowing the uh, sizes of the orbits of the Earth uh, compared to the orbit of the Moon and the masses of the Earth, Moon, and uh, Sun would need to be in there as well uh, if you're going to work out all of the equations. So they started to identify key issues, but no one has really got to a good answer uh, at this stage again based upon uh, either a consideration of the true uh, physical and temporal conditions, which is basically a grand way of saying, um, you know, in the sense of they've got models, but they don't actually represent the scale uh, involved. And that was the other thing uh, that sort of uh, is the issue with respect to uh, their discussion, is they all uh, seem to want to avoid using the real numbers. You know, what is the size of the Moon's orbit compared to the Earth's orbit? And, uh, and what is the, uh, the uh, orbital period of the Moon around the Earth uh, compared to the Earth's orbital period uh, around the Sun? Uh, they seem to have this aversion to actually looking at those numbers um, and sort of using them in any physical sense uh, with respect to their arguments. Uh, and or um, the various models, like the, the trencher, as uh, James Baddon has developed. So this idea of we need a good mathematical proof uh, is really uh, uh, becoming a bit more um, uh, prevalent in some sense. And so basically we become derailed. This is how I would ride the Perry Varney, uh, in some sense. Uh, <laughs> and why everyone doesn't end up like that, I don't actually know. Uh, so uh, we got to this stage, you know, the discussion basically closes at this stage of the game. I say, well, geometrically, no one's convinced anyone exactly what the shape of the curve could be. Uh, but then shortly afterwards uh, comes along another gentleman, I mentioned him in fact my last talk as well, uh, called James Ferguson, uh, who uh, immediately gets embroiled in um, a, a vicious public debate, uh, in the sense of through uh, various uh, letters um, and um, uh, pamphlets even as well were written about this. 1745, so we're a year on from um, Thomas Arrow saying, well, we really need some sort of you know, clear uh, mathematical proof. Um, Ferguson comes along. James Ferguson is, is a well-known figure in the history of astronomy. Uh, in fact, he moved to London. Uh, well, he was born up in uh, Scotland uh, near Edinburgh, if I recall rightly. He moved to London uh, just a few years before 1745, um, and he was basically setting himself up to be um, a lecturer, giving public lectures about sort of all sorts of um, uh, issues to do with uh, astronomy and physics and mathematics and clock making and all these other things that were popular at that time. Um, and he was famous for his demonstration devices. Um, and indeed, he uh, invents this thing called the Trajectium Lunare, which he presents to the Royal Society um, in 1745, to sort of great fanfare and all the rest of it. Uh, and then this is where he sort of gets into various trouble, uh, in the sense of, uh, again, we don't know who started uh, the, uh, writing these things, but uh, somebody immediately writes to the Gentleman's Magazine saying there's this sort of guy called James Ferguson who's pitched all the ideas and given none of us reference. So I presume it was someone between Philolus the letters to James Badder and JG and XY and Tom, you know, Thomas Sparrow and whoever um, felt that they weren't being given due credit for. Uh, so they, in fact, published pamphlets uh, you know, privately uh, and were circulated around saying Ferguson had pitched the idea. He said, well, I've never heard of this uh, gentleman's magazine, so you know, sort of leave me alone. Um, and then the, uh, the other intriguing thing is, the next player comes into play, um, was uh, when Ferguson introduced his device in 1745 uh, to the Royal Society, uh, he was also introduced to a fellow of the Royal Society at that time, James, James Ellicott, sorry, John Ellicott, uh, who was um, a relatively famous clockmaker at that time, so he was a skilled uh, mechanician, if you like, for cutting gears and making clocks. And he comes along and says, well, actually, you know, you know, he, uh, nobody invented it. I invented it about 20 years ago. But unfortunately, I no longer have the device with me, uh, which is convenient in some sense. Um, but nonetheless, um, the idea is, is that if we actually go 20 years or so back from 1745, uh, this would in fact take us to round about 1720, 1725. So, um, uh, and sort of not necessarily doubting his work at this stage of the game, but he might well uh, have made such a device for somebody who was uh, using uh, Graves Ender's book about Newtonian and the, the shape of the various orbits and what have you, uh, and tides uh, to demonstrate their classes. But we, unfortunately, uh, we just don't get any more of the dialogue with respect to why he made this thing 20 years ago um, and uh, exactly what he made and for whom and what, what have you. Uh, so, um, the, so that sort of, uh, well, we'll get to the, uh, the uh, trajectory of Lunarium in just a few moments. This is our first demonstration device, he says. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, 1753, and that's not a typo, sort of, uh, as it were, eight years on uh, from 1745, James Ferguson does eventually publish all the details of his, uh, uh, his device uh, in the Gentleman's Magazine. And this is it, uh, is it for, well, this is the diagram of it, I should say. Uh, but as I have no life, uh, and the saying goes, uh, I can actually give you um, a demonstration of the trajectory of Lunara uh, in the sense of two scale, if nothing else. So the idea here is we've got 
our mega banjo uh, in some sense. Uh, but the idea here is we're trying to show the orbit of the Moon and the Earth to scale. That's really the idea. And then we've also got uh, the idea of various divisions on here so that we can actually move the arm around, this arm here, uh, around through the, divided up into sort of uh, the idea we could do days. Uh, I guess either each one of the months uh, divisions here. This would be five days, well, I've shown in red just for sort of giving the basic idea. So this would correspond, in fact, to sweeping out the Earth's orbit uh, around the Sun during the course of one year. And then way down this other end, 2.06 metres away, it turns out, uh, this is where, to the same scale, uh, in the sense of from the centre of my little wing nut there, I'm going to say, yes, you could ask who's the wing nut here. I don't know. Uh, this is a wing nut here. That's the sun, and that's the Earth, the little blue, ooh, the little blue blob there. That's the Earth, and that corresponds to one astronomical unit. And on this scale, the moon's orbit around the Earth um, is, in fact, just a quarter of an inch, six millimetres. So, in fact, the little um, red pin there, he says, oh, claps everything. Um, that corresponds, that little red circle uh, on the, uh, the disc there, um, just a quarter inch in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, radius, I'll get it right in a minute. Uh, did I put separation? Yes, quarter inch in radius. Uh, that corresponds to the moon's orbit. And so again, the idea was, you know, you'd sort of think you'd put down on a piece of paper, a uh, big piece of paper, clearly, uh, and the idea was you could start off with the moon, um, well, the moon at some position over here on the Earth, and you could say, well, okay, let's go through a five-day interval. Thank God, you start with that one there. So the idea is then we can move um, the position of the... Uh, the Earth around the Sun, say to a five-day arc, which is something like that. Uh, it's just one of these divisions uh, on the sort of dial there. And then we could take the original position of the Moon here, move it along on our little quarter of an inch uh, radius circle to the next position, and then press that through onto a piece of paper over here. And then we move through another five-day time interval over there, move the Moon around again another bit, five days on its, and we can trace out the Moon's orbit. Um, so that's the general idea. Um, of what uh, Ferguson sort of introduced um, in uh, um, 1745, uh, I get it right a minute, uh, if I remember the year. So it was an ocular demonstration device, as he described it, uh, with the idea that what he's trying to do now is saying, well, okay, you know, if we're going to do it geometrically, we're going to map it out, well, let's at least do everything to scale. Uh, that's really the key thing. So that's why we have to end up with the, the one astronomical unit here uh, for the Earth's orbit, and then we're trying to put the moon's, uh, well, we're putting the moon's orbit there into scale as well, and then we're just letting everything rotate around, as the case may be. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, this is not the easiest of demonstration devices to use, uh, in the sense of you know, just the sheer physical size. Maybe you had bigger classrooms back then, I'm not too sure. Um, so the idea here was, was you know, perhaps uh, having sort of got to the idea of the scale model. Uh, and again, the idea here, although uh, I haven't uh, included in my little sort of mock-up here, uh, here's actually, uh, the idea was that uh, with this sort of cat gut here, going round the various sort of... Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the circle for the, uh, the, which would map out the time for the Earth's orbit corresponding to one year, around another little pulley over there, which would rotate 13, 13 times for every one uh, year. This would be the, uh, the number of moon orbits uh, you could have in a given year time interval. Uh, Whereas well, I guess he was sort of hoping to sort of show it sort of as he sort of physically moved it around. You could sort of see the, the moon moving around the Earth in its little orbit. Uh, I haven't tried to do that. I guess it was bad enough just trying to sort of cut this one out, I must admit. Uh, if nothing else, I learned making these devices is tricky. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, you do need a fair amount of skill to have a go at making these things. But it did occur to me that you might be able to do something a bit more um, easy to use in a classroom, at least in a modern day classroom, uh, going back to this idea that, in fact, all that we've really been doing here is a geometrical, as it says, an ocular demonstration. Uh, and we can come back to our sort of penny farthing uh, sort of mind's eye picture uh, with the idea that uh, essentially what we can work out from uh, all of the geometry is we want to uh, find uh, a circle, uh, there are two circles, one that's going to be the motion of the moon uh, in the centre of around uh, the disk of the, uh, uh, the, the penny part, uh, yeah, the penny, I, I can know, uh, penny and farthings, it's been so long since I used farthings, <laughs> not that I did, I hope, uh, actually, I might have. I think about it. I could be that old. Uh, but anyway, uh, the idea is, is that we can actually go back to uh, using this idea of a circle rolling around a bigger circle. We just have to sort of do, do bigger versions of this circle here, uh, which was the scale for the, the Earth's orbit uh, on um, 
Ferguson's model. So the bit that we make this circle, in fact we can make this circle as well, also bigger, although it does then mean that we end up with a sort of a massive great circle, uh, which is not very practical, but we can always take segments of a circle, that's really the key thing. So the trajectorium lunare Mark II, uh, which sort of seemed like a sort of, again, another thing one could try and make, uh, is going back to XY's curtate epicycle, because in fact it does give in fact, the right shape, uh, believe it or not, for the uh, orbit. So uh, this is where uh, now things do get again big, if that's the right way of saying it, uh, with the idea we're going to have uh, the moon's disk, if you like, moving around, uh, as shown in red here, um, and then the idea is that's going to also move around uh, the, uh, the blue circle there, <laughs> with the idea of everything's sort of right, with the idea that that's going to correspond to one astronomical unit, um, and then we're going to have near the hub of our little red circle here, uh, the, uh, the Earth-Moon separation. And even on the scale that, you know, sort of seems sort of even big uh, and convenient to use, it just fits on a table, uh, we can still only get to a separation where the Earth and Moon are just, uh, just under one centimetre apart. So it's uh, maybe a bit bigger than uh, we have for the Ferguson one, but not that much. Uh, so I chose, well, I chose uh, a radius of 25 centimetres for uh, the moon circle. So this is the moon circle over here, uh, in the sense of, uh, if we take that to be 25 centimetres, and essentially this is uh, made out of that cardboard with a foam inner part there, and 25, 25 centimetres is the biggest circle I could make out of such a card I could uh, buy from Walmart. Uh, so that's why it's 25 centimetres, and then it turns out the spacing then between uh, the, uh, the centre of that circle, which will correspond to the Earth's orbit, and the moon's orbit will be nine uh, millimetres apart. Not point nine millimetres apart. In fact, nine millimetres would be much better. Um, so that's the, that just sets the scale between the Earth and the moon's orbit. And then the idea here is we have to then uh, find uh, or let this circle, uh, representing this sort of the one that's going to roll around eventually, um, we have to have the larger circle that it's rolling around having a circumference being uh, essentially well 30.3683 uh, uh, as it says right at the bottom there um, times larger circumference because the idea is, is this circle's going to round, roll around this one but we have to get the scale right um, so that's where the idea of the, uh, the radius of the blue circle here turns out to be 3.315 uh, again way too many decimal places uh, but 3.3 meters. Uh, so that's another meter longer uh, than the Ferguson one. But as I said, we can take a, um, a fraction of it. So again, just to demonstrate I have no life. Um, here is a 30 degree segment um, of a circle of radius 3.3 uh, meters or 22 foot diameter. So that's about, um, well, I guess you can get some idea of the size of the circle about which the whole thing is going to be rolling around. Um, and so as I said, you had to set this up in the kitchen with a bit of string and do all the, the appropriate stuff to cut it out. Um, but the idea is, and I guess this is where I sort of uh, um, have to sort of uh, pretend I know what I'm doing uh, in the sense of a demonstration. So we've got the, the so this is the, the arc of, over which we're going to just consider uh, the circle of the moon over there rolling. So we're not going to do all the way around the Earth's orbit, we just because then we'd need a circle 22 feet across, and that's not very really practical. So we're just taking a segment of it, uh, and then the idea is if we then um, put this onto a paper, and, and uh, this is where we use the medieval thumb grips, as they say. To clamp this to the table, this is where I should have uh, some sort of uh, song and dance routine just to uh, go with the uh, filling in the uh, putting things in place. Usually, where something goes catastrophically wrong, um, it's a bit like actors when they say, "What it never never work with dogs or children or something like that." So never do demonstrations in a talk. I guess it's usually the answer that most people say. Because uh, if it's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong right in the middle of the talk. Uh, but the idea is, you want that to be in reasonably what solid. Um, on the table, and then the idea here is, is that's our arc uh, for the moon's path, and then the idea, the next thing is to just roll along uh, the uh, circle, I'll do this in just a few minutes, we're going to roll that along the arc. So I guess we'll sort of set this up. Um, so uh, again, uh, it's, got, it's, it's kind of, even when you get, it's not that exciting, I have to admit. <laughs> the end result is just two curves. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it gives the right idea, perhaps, we will say. Uh, so we'll set that up there just for a moment. The board around there. It does make a sort of kind of a squeaky sound, I must admit. So we'll start with uh, the idea of the, the disc here. Uh, again, uh, clearly it's not a brilliant demonstration device, because it's I'm doing it sort of horizontally here, whereas if I could do it on the board, that'd be even better, but uh, I'm not that skilled at making these things. But the idea is, is that we can now move this or roll this around uh, with the idea that it should be uh, the, ooh, ah, that immediately went wrong. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I let go. I panicked. <laughs> Maybe I should have done it in short. Uh, we'll sort of try and do that backwards. Um, 
of move there. So, uh, but the idea here is, well, ooh, actually, the pen's not working. That's another, I told you something was bound to go wrong. Uh, what have I got not working? The moon's orbit's not working. The black pen. Oh, my goodness. No, that's the Earth's orbit. <laughs> we'll try and get it in there yet again. Technically, we move on. Oh, there we go. We're sort of there. But the idea is, um, and it sort of works in this particular case, I think I should have um, put new pens in there. But um, the idea is, uh, as they say on TV, I made one earlier, <laughs> just in case. Uh, this is where I need to have, uh, uh, well, we can pass it around. But the idea here is, uh, maybe I can just hold that in front of you. Um, put it in front of the front row here as my sort of impartial um, judges on this particular uh, track. With the idea here is that um, the, the blue pen there uh, represents the, the moon's path. Uh, so in other words, it's sort of coming inside of the Earth's orbit here, uh, smoothly goes outside, then this will be a corresponding to full moon, uh, and then we're going back to this will be the first quarter moon, and then back to new moon over here, the black circle, or the black line there, not showing up so well in here, uh, and that's where I slipped on this one as well. That corresponds, in fact, just to a perfect circle, and that would be the Earth's orbit. So the black uh, ink line there is a sort of curve of the Earth's orbit, uh, and the blue uh, is the moon's orbit, and so we can see we're not getting epicycles, I guess is the key thing. It's not doing that sort of petal business uh, of going sort of, you know, around uh, the circle of the Earth. Uh, we don't have any cusps in the diagram in the sense of things coming in and then going straight out again, as we'd have in an epicycle. It's just a smooth curve uh, for the moon, uh, sort of just nicely smoothly, always in fact curving uh, in the sense of in direction towards where the sun would be, which is over the back of the room there. So, um, although, uh, as I say, you shouldn't do these things, uh, and I sort of totally failed, well, it's sort of there, you can sort of look at it, I guess my black pen is not working all the time, it's sort of intermittently working, so there's always something that goes wrong. So, the idea is, is you can actually show the Earth's orbit, and indeed, we can move forward now to various textbooks, this is one, uh, it had a particularly nice diagram called Other Worlds by GP Service, 1901, um, mm -hmm. and sort of showing that same illustration. Uh, and uh, the idea here is we've got the curve, uh, the circle there for the Earth's orbit, and then the idea is it's sort of just showing here the, the path of the moon, uh, you know, no, no circles, no wiggles, uh, essentially, um, of it's just a sort of, it's not a perfect circle by any means, but it's always uh, curving, in fact, towards the sun, which would be down here in the sort of lower part of the diagram. Um, but again, uh, the point at this stage is, even with um, uh, James Ferguson coming along, um, is that it's still uh, just purely, you know, it's a geometrical proof. And somehow, uh, you know, the, the mind rebels sometimes about these things. and say, well, you know, okay, you know, that, you know, that's what circles do, but, you know, is it really what the moon does uh, in orbit? Uh, as so, as Gandalf would say, you know, is this sort of just some ocular trick uh, of the Dark Lord himself? Um, and, uh, well, so the question was still open at this stage again. Okay, um, you know, Ferguson never claimed that this was a proof uh, of the path uh, of the moon, just saying, you know, this is what it should look like geometrically, um, and if it does something else, well, you know, that's someone else's problem, perhaps. And indeed, we have to move forward, and it's a result that comes right out of the blue, in some sense, in 1761. Um, and it's another one of those more um, interesting journals to read every now and then. Uh, it was uh, a straight, by a somewhat strange journal called, by um, a gentleman called Benjamin Martin, who was famous for uh, designing these planetary uh, machines, sort of showing the, sort of the motion of comets around the sun and planets around the sun, and, uh, you know, uh, relative orbits and uh, things like sort of, um, you know, eclipse phenomena and such devices. And so one of the things he did uh, was have this journal called the Miscellaneous Correspondence in prose and verse, um, and I guess you know, people would send him things. And again, just, as it said, literally out of the blue, for no clear reason, uh, we find in 1761 now, so we've moved forward um, you know, sort of 17 or so years uh, from sort of James Ferguson, uh, and we're nearly 20 years on from Philip Laster asking the, sort of the specific question, uh, then uh, we have this paper here by the Reverend Simon Reader. Um, and as Keith Moon would say, who and when? Uh, or maybe just say who, no, I'm not too sure. We do remember the who, don't we? Okay, just checking here. Okay, not dating myself too much. Um, so, uh, but the point is, uh, Benjamin Martin introduced this thing, saying, I was forward of this following theory by ingenious and learned friend uh, some years ago. Um, so there's no uh, indication about why he didn't 
you know, sort of publish it in his journal um, you know, earlier on, and there's no particular reason why he published in January 1761, but nonetheless it does come out. Um, and indeed, this is the, if you like, the abstract or the opening part, a demonstration that the moon passes at the time of conjunction, uh, so that's new moon, uh, so when that's when the, uh, we have the sun, earth, a moon and earth in alignment. Um, he's talking about the geometry of that uh, with the idea uh, at the time of conjunction, uh, the, the moon passes further from the sun than a right line drawn betwixt two places, so I guess the idea is you've got uh, two places, the reference points, and then we're looking about where the moon is uh, with respect to those two uh, straight lines drawn between those two points, uh, particularly uh, one before, one after conjunction, and can be distant from it. Uh, the point is a corollary that he draws from this, which is, again, it's a sort of a, uh, a geometrical, as you can see from the construction here, uh, argument. Um, he then sort of uh, argues that uh, you can show that at all times, uh, the path uh, is curving towards the sun. There's no time uh, anywhere in the moon's orbit where it's as if it's moving away from the sun, even for a very short instant. Um, so that was the uh, 1761. Uh, again, sort of coming back to the geometry, uh, but being a bit more sort of classy in some sense with the analysis uh, than James Badder was back in 1743, um, and uh, you know, sort of being a bit more clear geometrical argument about what was going on. Um, but sort of, again, not necessarily convincing uh, beyond the, the pure geometry. But uh, a reader uh, of uh, the miscellaneous correspondence came back in the sort of the uh, couple of months later, in the March 1761 uh, edition, the Reverend Charles Wildbore, um, what a great name that is. Um, and in fact, we come to now finding the very first clear proof that the moon's orbit um, has to always be this curve. It's a continuous curve, uh, what's called in the modern language a, um, a convex curve, although he's calling it here a concave curve, uh, in the sense of curving towards, uh, is in modern language what we call a convex curve or mathematicians call it that, um, the idea is, is that it's always going to be curving towards the sun, and the proof is based upon, in fact, going back to Gravenders, although he doesn't give any reference to Gravenders, uh, 1722 discussion, uh, you can sort of see that it must be in the back of his mind, the way he develops the proof. Uh, for, this is the only diagram he's got in the page there, uh, in the sense that it's only about two pages long. Uh, but the idea is a demonstration that the path or curve is the moon, uh, centre of the moon describes in, in the expanse, in other words, its shape, uh, is everywhere concave towards the sun, um, and so in other words, it's just a perfect. You know, it doesn't have cusps in it. It doesn't have you know any time when it might be moving away from the sun um, by the perturbation of, uh, in fact, the Earth. Um, Earth's gravity. We'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, again, we don't know an awful lot about James Wildbore. Uh, I, well, maybe I'll even go back. We, don't, we know even less about the Reverend Simon Reader. Perhaps it might be one way of saying it. I knew I, there was a reason that Keith Moon was there. Uh, who and when? Uh, in the sense of, but the only thing we know about Simon Reader, he was supposedly one of these dissenting. Um, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, Dis uh, member of the dissenting church uh, that had broken away from the Church of England at that time, um, who I guess the idea, you know, they were sort of, the, the, they wanted to uh, break away from some of the doctrine of the Church of England at that time, and they also set up schools um, to, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, teach, uh, well, uh, everything in some sense, uh, but apparently was um, known or renowned for his mathematical skill, uh, but that was about it. That's all we know. We don't even know, uh, you know sort of exactly uh, what he was doing, where he went to school, or what have you. Uh, but nonetheless, um, he was sort of clearly uh, somebody who knew what he was talking about. And it's the same with Charles Wilder. We don't know an awful lot about his life, um, uh, other than uh, he was clearly somebody of great mathematical skill. Uh, indeed, he reviewed um, the mathematical manuscripts presented to the Royal Society, and he's one of the few people I've ever heard of who actually turned down a fellowship to the Royal Society uh, of London. Uh, he sort of wrote back saying, I shall remain a humble village pastor, which is, I guess, a good thing, I guess, in some sense. Um, but he did, in 1780, become editor of the Gentleman's Diary, so that was the one formed in 1740, uh, by 1741 by James Badder, if you remember, the one, the Mathematical Repository. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, well, I guess, as I say, this is the actual uh, uh, proof where he goes back to basics, and he starts now now, uh, introducing the equations due to, you know, saying, well, you know, if the moon is doing anything, it's got to be governed by gravity, and if gravity is going to be at work, it's going to relate to the masses of the moon, the masses of the earth, and the masses of the sun, um, and their various separations and size of their orbit, and he goes through all this, and he sets up this condition of convexity, uh, as we would now call it, that is, where is the, uh, the force that's controlling, if you like, or uh, dictating the motion of the moon, uh, as it moves around in its path, where is the central force? And he shows that, in fact, it is actually centred on the sun. That, in fact, the sun is the focus of the moon's path around the sky. So in some sense, he ends up by saying uh, that the moon is essential. The moon and the earth is really a double planet. 
uh, if, the, if the Earth just suddenly disappeared, then the Moon would continue on, on its orbit, almost exactly as the Earth presently is moving around uh, in its orbit. So we end up with a, quite a remarkable uh, discussion. Uh, going into that, but based now upon the physics of Newtonianism, um, and indeed the condition is well satisfied, we are good to go, as uh, certain politicians sometimes say. Um, and uh, in a sense, when we put numbers in for these two ratios, uh, it turns out that the condition for uh, the Sun uh, being the dominant gravitational central um, force acting upon the Moon uh, is related to the uh, ratio of the masses, the Moon, uh, the Earth, the uh, yeah, the Earth's mass to the Sun mass, um, and the Earth's. Uh, orbital radius and the moon's orbital radius about the Earth uh, squared. Um, it looks a bit odd uh, when you look at that, but in fact, um, some of you uh, will know about Kepler's third law uh, can actually show that it relates to this idea of, uh, in fact, the um, looking at the size of the orbit and the orbital period, which brings us right back to the demonstration geometrical models. So now we've finally shifted, in some sense, to something that looks like uh, a modern dynamical proof based upon looking at the gravitational interaction between the Earth, Moon, and the Sun. Um, um, and indeed, you can now uh, draw out, uh, you can write down the equations uh, and put in the appropriate numbers for the moon's orbit, uh, and this is what the computer finds. And I guess if you look at it carefully, you can see it's not a perfect circle. Uh, it's a 13-sided circle, if that makes sense, um, but at all times, uh, it's uh, convex uh, in the sense of uh, curving towards the sun, that is. Uh, it never curves away. Um, and uh, in the sense of the convexity condition means that you can take any two points on the curve shown in red here, and if you draw a line between those two points, any two points on the curve, it's always interior to the curve, which is the uh, modern day uh, uh, con uh, condition for convexity. Uh, and so this is where, in fact, the Kepler's third law bit comes into play. Uh, you can actually show that what's called the radius of curvature. Again, you'll be pleased to know I won't go through that, uh, but it's a measure of uh, you know, exactly what the, uh, the curvature of, the, of this curve does. You can express that in terms of uh, the uh, differential equations associated with the Uh, this idea of the moon's orbit always being curved towards the sun. Um, but it's invariably, um, you know, the no attribution is given to who first might have thought of this, you know, usually in sort of these sort of books, you sort of say, and it was so-and-so who came up with this idea. Um, and in, in some sense, you can actually trace uh, the evolution, if that's the right way of saying it, or the history uh, of the problem. Because certainly in 1742, it was an open question. Nobody knew what the answer was to the shape of the moon's orbit, uh, considered from above, um, and sort of as the Earth, uh, you know, as it followed the Earth around, um, uh, in its orbit around the sun. They offered various geometrical, instrumental ideas about what they thought the shape should be, uh, and there was a sort of a to and fro you know, arguments about who was right and who was wrong and what really needs to be considered and so on. Uh, then we move into a time where uh, we've got this idea of, you know, well, if we can't prove it on paper, let's draw it on paper, but then draw it to scale, hence our major banjo over here, uh, and so on. And so this is James Ferguson uh, and John Elliott by around about that time. And then in the 1970s, we move into this idea of you know, a mathematical proof. Um, and uh, with the uh, Reverend uh, Charles Wildbore uh, in 1761 sort of coming up with his proof. Uh, and then I guess you can start searching you know, for all the various sort of classic books that were written about sort of astronomy um, in that time interval from uh, the mid-1700s, certainly to the mid-1800s. And as it says in my little thing here, uh, basically sort of obscurity um, is the only thing that sort of uh, our heroes have. Uh, indeed, when you read the obituary uh, for Wildboy in 1802, um, the you know, people were sort of writing then, you know, he made one, in fact, that quote there, he made it his business to prove the moon's orbit was always concave. Uh, but for as, soon as, as soon as he dies, everyone forgets it, I guess, or forgets him, perhaps. And so you start to find uh, then the sort of the classic books that were coming around uh, in the mid 1800s, you know, with the sort of great description of astronomy, uh, the outline of astronomy by John Herschel, for example, 1849, mentions the entire topic, talks about the idea of the shape of the moon's uh, orbit uh, being this curve, uh, and it's always curved towards the sun, um, but doesn't offer any proof, and it doesn't offer any indication about who might have first uh, suggested this or shown it to be the true case. So, in other words, in about a hundred year time interval, it's gone from a sort of an open question, which sort of people are sort of uh, trying to get out from all sorts of different directions, both dynamic in the terms of Newtonian um, sort of physics, if you like, uh, geometrical mathematical proofs, model proofs of one form or another, and then within 50 years from that, 
Uh, it's sort of just basically a standard result that's in every textbook, or at least uh, every textbook at that particular time. Uh, so uh, I guess that in itself, I think, was interesting. Well, it seemed interesting that you know the way uh, in which uh, the sort of very rapidly this sort of was adopted in some sense as being well, you know, common sense. Uh, but things are always common sense once somebody's gone through all the pains of pointing out to you uh, the details, if that's the right way of saying it. So, you'll be pleased to know, we finally finished the end, uh, in the sense of, uh, so I had to, use, I had to show that picture, uh, if nothing else, the sort of the modern day version of the penny farthing. But essentially that's all that we've been talking about, uh, is circles rounding and welding around circles, but putting the Earth, Moon, uh, the Sun in their appropriate positions, that is to scale, uh, and also the right temporal uh, rotations of one thing going around another. Uh, and then we find that we end up with this sort of 13-sided circle, if that's the right expression again, uh, that's always curved towards the sun. Again, sort of, um, you know, not what we might necessarily expect from the first sort of uh, images we might have produced when we say, well, what is the shape of the moon's path um, during the course of one year? You know, we tend to have, as I said before, that, that's something more of a wavy line or an epicycle um, of one form or another. Um, but it turns out to be something totally different. But getting there took 50 years' worth of sort of uh, uh, modelling, mathematical geometry, uh, as well as sort of playing this sort of Newtonian dynamics of one form or another. So I'll stop there. I think I'm better because I've over overstayed my welcome. Uh, so um, just a sort of a, a public health warning. Uh, there's nothing else. Uh, I could have said don't come to my talk, maybe. Uh, but no, 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 health and happiness go cycling, uh, and we'll leave it at that. As I say. All right. Um, I think that's we'll the time for it. <laughs> The reason for the obscurity, just a simple accident, or was I, it, it because he refused I, fellowship? I, that's right. I, yeah, I, it, it would be an interesting. Um it's not entirely clear to me because uh, certainly you know, the people who, like John Herschel, would have been writing these sort of very popular books would have known about Charles Wildball because of the, you know, the very circles in which they moved. So it's not entirely clear to me why it wasn't included or sort of was dropped from the picture in some sense. Um, uh, I, I mean, one, um, you know, I guess as we move into that 18, mid 1800s or so, we're starting to get to that time where uh, the science is now becoming very much this sort of uh, institutionalized sort of within universities. Universities and you know we're sort of trying to um, you know, legitimise ourselves by you know, we're all learned scholars and all the rest of it. And so this humble pastor who refused fellowship to the Royal Society, the eminent structure uh, for science and mathematics, um, it might have had something to play with, you know, with that sort of obscurity in some sense. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Oh, there was a uh, the discussion seems to be entirely uh, very theoretical, mathematical proposition hypotheses. Is there anything that empirical evidence, is, is there anything that observation could have assisted in that? And today would we have more powerful telescopes? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly today we'd use? be able to measure it directly. Um, I guess at the time, uh, I'd, yeah, certainly at that time they wouldn't really been able to um, have measured anything with anywhere near the right sort of accuracy to you know, gauge distances or the, uh, you know, the true shape of a curve. Uh, in, in the modern era, we have things like laser ranging of the moon, which is a continuous process. So we, we know the position of the moon down to about a centimetre at any one time now. Uh, so we can actually measure you know, this thing and plot it out uh, in the modern era. But that's, um, at that time, um, it was really, um, I suppose, you know, I, I, the, the only tools they had in some sense was the geometry. Um, and, uh, you know, if they knew enough about the idea of the, uh, um, you know, uh, New Newtonian gravitational dynamics, they might have tried to bring that in as well. Although, it, as um, um, eventually Wild Boar did. Uh, but it took a while, uh, I guess, in some sense. I guess they were just playing with, you know, um, the geometry because that was the main area they thought the answer would re reside, I suppose. Yes. Um, so this business of the curve always being, you know, that it's always curved toward the sun. Yes. That's very counterintuitive, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm yes. wondering why I'm having such a hard time believing it. That's, yeah, that's right. And I, I think that's part of the reason why um, it's one of those issues that, uh, in the, it, it, as I say, it doesn't often be included even in modern day astronomy textbook. It's not an obvious uh, intuitive um, sort of result in some sense. Um, and to get at the details about why it always has to be um, the, uh, you know, the curvature um, being such that it's always curving towards the sun um, is, uh, well, you know, dare I say, uh, you can actually do these things um, in the sense of, uh, this is the condition. Uh, again, I'm skipping over slides here, so I might as well show them as a, as a question was asked. Thank you, sir. Hit that $5 bill. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the sense of, uh, you can sort of, uh, you can now in the modern, you can define this, it's called convex curves, which is this idea of, um, you know, as I was saying before, if you take two points anywhere on that curve, 
then the line drawn between them should always be interior to the boundary. That's what we mean by this idea of a convex curve in the modern era, which is what they would have called a concave curve. Um, and it turns out, if you go to uh, the equation, uh, well, this is it, not exactly user-friendly, uh, but this is the thing that actually is a measure of the uh, convexity, which it gives you some idea of how that curve is working. It relates to the idea of the radius of a circle with the same curvature uh, for a tangent point of a curve. So, uh, again, it's, there's a lot of background where that, you know, so, do, do, you know, so, so that, that's something you can't really introduce just out of nowhere and say, well, the answer's there, obvious, isn't it, uh, in some sense. Uh, but it, the answer is in that, in essence. You have to show uh, that this quantity, uh, the row here, uh, is less than one, and then you know that you're dealing with a convex curve, um, as you know, the idea of always sort of uh, with this idea of curving towards uh, the sun. Uh, and uh, so uh, the idea is you need to know the shape of the curve, as it says here. You need to know how y, uh, x and, uh, what x and y vary uh, with respect to the position. Uh, so um, the, uh, there, is, there, are, there are, maybe the next slide as well, I sort of try to sort of do some of that uh, on the computer. Uh, but just to go to show, uh, if you take the, this, this can be our, uh, uh, our description of the, this would in fact be the Earth's orbit in here, this is the Moon's orbit. You can do all that differentiation, work out the values here, and you can see it does vary. The curvature is not constant, but it's always less than, one, uh, less than zero. In other words, it has to be curved towards the sun. That's the, that's the mathematical proof, as they say. Um, and again, it's non-intuitive. I guess I, you know, it wouldn't have been uh, the sort of curve or result that I would have expected. In fact, this is the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the solid line there represents a portion of the moon's curve shown to the circular uh, track the dash line there of the Earth. The, the way, I mean, you know, obviously, I believe all this because you know. It's, it's, <laughs> would I like to trust yeah, me? Exactly, right? um, <laughs> but just you know, naively, you would think, well, every month the Moon reaches a point where it's at its closest to the Sun. Yes. And then you know, a few days later, that distance will be larger. A few days earlier, it was also larger. So right. naively, I would think, well, therefore, at least for some finite period. The concavity has to be the other way. Yes, right? that's, right. I, I, that's yes. what my people yes, I, 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 I entirely agree. Okay. Uh, that, 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 that intuitively, that's exactly what uh, one would think, and indeed, that's yeah. what all that geometrical okay. uh, early dialogue was about. Um, I guess the uh, where it sort of, if you like, sort of changes from that picture is the fact that you do have to consider uh, the fact that the Earth is also moving around the Sun at the same time, and in some sense, that starts to smooth any sort of uh, you know kinks, if you like, out of the curve. Um, and uh, I guess the, um, uh, the idea is, is the moon's orbital radius for the moon's orbital period is such that uh, you do end up with just this sort of perfectly, well, this sort of, I say, perfectly 13-sided circle, if you get my meaning, uh, such that um, the, at no times did it actually curve away from the sun uh, in its actual path. It's, uh, so again, it's sort of, it was one of those intriguing things about the sort of the development of the question and, and the answer in some sense. Uh, and it, uh, again, it's one of those things you come away thinking, well, there must be some tricky there somewhere. I'm just doing something like that. That's uh, how I feel, but I'll go. You'll go with the flow. Okay, <laughs> that's good. All right, I'll move up with this time just in case. <laughs> yes, sorry. Just curious, you know, is this a unique feature of the Earth and the Moon, or does this seem to be true for um, other it's, uh, it's, uh, There are, in fact, other satellites, um, believe it or not. He says, um, I, I, I clearly preempted and guessed all the questions that might be asked. Uh, it turns out Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have similar such moons, uh, although they're the outermost moons in the sense of it's the 61st moon, uh, the outermost moon of Saturn that, in fact, also satisfies this condition, and then the outermost moon of Uranus, and, in fact, the outer two moons of Neptune. Uh, when you look at their orbital characteristics, have uh, the same sort of, uh, you'll end up with the same uh, answer in terms of a, um, uh, the idea of a, you know, a, a perfectly smooth, well, a smooth, uh, continuously curving towards the, the sun uh, path for these particular moons. Uh, as you move inwards, uh, when the orbital periods get more rapid uh, for these, uh, these particular, the inner satellites of these, uh, these particular moons, then in fact you would have epicycles if you plotted them out, if that it turns out. Uh, so there's a whole range of possibilities in, the, in some of the other moons. Uh, sorry, yeah, some of the other moons are other uh, planets. Yes? I was going to have the exact uh, Okay, oh, that's right. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, so, um, actually what surprised me within the 61 moons of uh, Saturn, <laughs> I lost count, <laughs> as the saying goes. Uh, although, as it says there, that's actually right on the threshold of that sort of, uh, um, in fact, the, the curvature is about zero, it turns out. Or, oh, or, yes. I'd expect this is important if we put telescopes on the moon, but do you know of any implications of 
Ah. How they would implement uh, this knowledge uh, uh, oh, there? Oh, right. Um, am I aware? Um, I think the short answer is no. <laughs> it's a purely um, intellectual problem, if that's the right way of saying it. Um, the, uh, I, I can't necessarily... Um, let me think. Um, I mean, well, it's, yeah, I, I suppose at some level, if you were setting up, say, a sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, tracking a telescope system or something on the moon, you'd, have, you'd certainly have to know all about the dynamics, and this would be in part of all that moon motion uh, in some sense. So I suppose it would have a, a practical sort of, um, um, you know, issue, if that's what they're saying. But I don't, it wouldn't be the major issue, <laughs> I think it's fair to say. Um, I'm not aware of any, um, uh, if you like, utility of this particular piece of knowledge that I've now given to you all. <laughs> I'm feeding you useless knowledge. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martin. Okay. Does anybody need a trajectory of Lunaria? <laughs> I fear it's going to be sitting in the corner of my office for a long time. Going cheap. Going cheap, yes, that's right. <laughs>